is TJ, I'm the program coordinator. It's my pleasure to welcome you here to the beautiful Rancho Mirage Library and Observatory. Uh, just a couple quick announcements before we get started. Um, one, just if you have a phone with you, make sure you have that on silent. Um, also wanted to thank our partners. Uh, this is a unique program that we have partnered with the Learning and Retirement Group to do. Uh, so a lot of the programming that we do is funded through our foundation. That's extremely important. Um, and those donations that come in support that, uh, those programs. However, a program like this is just a pure partnership. So no money is changing hands here between the organizations. It's just, you know, they fit really well together. And I really like when we can do stuff because everyone wins um, when it comes to something like that. And they provide some great programming and you get to learn about learning and retirement and the other classes they do. And then hopefully if you knew about that but hadn't been to the library, you kind of know a little bit about what we do here. Uh, speaking of what we do here, um, our program guide has everything coming up. Uh, we do have a great concert scheduled for tomorrow night with Cara Caro Pierto. Uh, and we've never had her here, but she looks absolutely fantastic. So that's at 7 p.m. tomorrow. So please do join us for that. Uh, we also are showing a documentary um, on Friday with Jason Brooks, Meeting Gorbachev as a documentary. Um, and then I do have kind of a bummer of an announcement. Uh, Dr. William Gutelunas, who speaks here almost every year, um, was scheduled to speak next week on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Um, but unfortunately, due to unforeseen circumstances, isn't gonna be able to make it this year. So just wanted to make everyone aware of that. Um, but with that, I wanna go ahead and get started uh, on today's program. Um, we're so happy to have uh, Jerry Swirsky here today. Um, he's gonna provide a brief description of the operation of the Supreme Court and then uh, a discussion of some landmark decisions. Uh, Swirsky is a graduate of Yale University and practiced law for approximately 40 years in both the state court and federal courts of Connecticut. So please help me welcome Jerry Swirsky. Thank you. Uh, and thank you to um, LIR and uh, um, allowing me to talk to you a little bit about the Supreme Court um, today. Uh, it's a topic which obviously in today's world um, is a subject of a lot of controversy because of the makeup of the court. And I'm happy to tell you right now, I'm not gonna get into that. <laughs> I, I, this is not gonna be a political discussion, presumably. Okay, so uh, I, I want to start by just telling you very briefly, many of you probably know this, how, know, know this, how the Supreme Court works. So we know there's a Chief Justice and, a, and eight Associate Justices, nominated by the President and confirmed with the advice and consent of the Senate. Uh, as you're aware, Presidents typically nominate someone they believe will share their political and judicial philosophies. But the history, the history of the Supreme Court is replete with justices who were supposed to be one persuasion and turned out to be much different. For example, Earl Warren, anybody ever heard of Earl Warren in the state of California? Was a governor, considered very conservative, ultimately became Chief Justice of the Supreme Court and participated in many decisions and, and, and wrote many opinions that were far from being conservative. So, also in rare instances such as boundary line disputes between states, which hardly ever happen these days, the litigants have a right to bring their claim directly, directly to the Supreme Court. Whoops. Okay. Um, now, uh, let's see if this will work here. Okay, normally the Supreme Court gets to choose the cases it hears as a result of a petition from a lower court. That's the procedure. After a case has been decided by a lower state or federal court, a litigant has the right to file a petition with the Supreme Court and that's called a writ of certiorari, Latin, which is the technical term for the writ the Supreme Court issues when it agrees to hear and decide an appeal. The court 
typically will consider something like seven to 8,000 petitions a year. And in the selection process, the justices look for cases of constitutional significance and other matters of national importance. So after an initial screening process that eliminates most of these petitions, the justices meet to consider the remaining petitions on Wednesdays and Fridays in a secure conference room in which no outsiders, no outsiders are allowed. It takes a vote of four justices out of the nine to grant cert, meaning to allow the case to uh, be heard. <clears throat> if cert is not granted, the decision of the lower court remains undisturbed. And you have appeals from circuit courts of appeals or uh, cases that came up right from state courts and they came through all the various appellate courts. Ultimately, the Supreme Court will decide whether or not that case should be heard by that court. From the thousands of petitions for certiorari it receives each year, <clears throat> excuse me, the current court typically accepts about 80 cases on which it renders written decisions. Oral arguments are presented and the justices will interrupt and ask the lawyers difficult and pointed questions, sometimes for the purpose of honestly exploring the merits of an issue or sometimes for the purpose of reinforcing a favored position or constructively tearing down a disfavored position in the hope of building support among the justices. Because as you can, you, you are aware, uh, uh, justices don't come into a case necessarily agreed upon not only the decision, but the basis of the decision, whether there's a constitutional basis or some other basis to, to go in a certain direction. Very important to remember that. After oral argument, a conference is scheduled at which the justices discuss and vote, <coughs> excuse me, on how a case should be decided at least at that point. If the, this is very important, if the chief justice is in the majority, sometimes he may be, sometimes he's not necessarily. If he's in the majority, he assigns either himself or another justice to write the majority opinion. If not, this, whoever the senior justice in, in the majority is makes that assignment. Other justices may write their own concurring or dissenting opinions. That's always available to any other justice on the court. The opinions then are circulated among the justices in the effort to build as much consensus as possible. Debates and discussions are continued and opinions are revised as the justices continue to exchange views among themselves. Now this is interesting. Approximately 20 to 30% of the cases carry only a 5-4 majority. That's a lot of cases that are very close. 5-4 majority, okay? 20 to 30 percent. Keep that in mind. So, let's go back all the way. Um, everybody understands or has heard of the term judicial review. It's not a, 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 a clause or a, a reference that came out of any statute or of the Constitution. Where did the, the concept, the concept of judicial review come from? Well, there was a case, and many of you may have read it or heard of it in school, later on, books, a case called Marbury versus Madison, a case decided in 1803. And let me give you a little background about that case, okay? Let's go back in time. 
So there was a presidential election in 1800, and Thomas Jefferson and Aaron Burr, you all know those names, received the same number of electoral votes. And therefore, the election was thrown into the House of Representatives. And Jefferson was elected on the 36th ballot. Got it? OK. A little bit of a difficult election. The lame duck Federalist Congress then enacted something called the Judiciary Act of 1801. And that act created 42 new federal judgeships. Now, John Marshall, who was the Chief Justice and also Secretary of State, I guess you could do that back then. You could be both a Secretary of State and the Chief Justice. He failed to deliver, ultimately deliver, the appropriate signed commissions to the new judges. Big deal. William Marbury who was nominated as Justice of the Peace in District of Columbia never received his commission. And so President Jefferson, who was president at the time, instructed James Madison, his new Secretary of State, not to deliver Marbury's commission. A little game playing, even back then. Marbury sued and asked for a writ of mandamus ordering Madison to deliver the commission. Now, writ of mandamus, that phrase is, just means you are ordered to do a certain thing. Okay, so those were writs that required a particular officer or commission to, to carry out what they were supposed to carry out. So that's what Marbury did. He sued and he brought that writ of mandamus, ordering Madison to deliver this commission. Now, Marbury did not begin his case in a lower court but rather filed suit back then directly in the Supreme Court. Probably wouldn't happen like that today. And Marshall, Justice John Marshall, wrote the majority opinion. The court voted that Marbury had a right to his commission. And the question is, was Marbury entitled to a legal remedy in the courts? Was that the way you, you were supposed to go about it? And Marshall said, yes. That yes, you can put in quotation marks and quotation marks and quotation marks because having said yes, that created to a certain extent the concept of judicial review, a big deal. Marshall turned to the question of whether the Supreme Court itself could issue a writ of mandamus to order the commission. First time it had ever been done. The answer was no. No, no. Even though the Judiciary Act of 1789, which was enacted by the first Congress, provided for same, the court concluded, John Marshall wrote the opinion, that this provision was unconstitutional. Now, the analysis turned on the distinction between the Supreme Court's original, typically a trial court, jurisdiction and a court that reviews the rulings of a lower court which has appellate jurisdiction. So in this case, what you're seeing is the ultimate development of what the Supreme Court, which was part of the separation of powers, what were they supposed to do and how were they supposed to do it? Got that? Okay. So since Article Three. Section 2 of the Constitution limited the Supreme Court's original jurisdiction to specific cases now involving ambassadors, other public ministers, and councils, and those in which a state is a party, which did not, none of those applied in this Marbury case, the provision of the Judiciary Act did not apply and was unconstitutional. But the court had to decide that point. Congress, the end result was the finding that Congress could not give the Supreme Court the power to issue writs of mandamus in its original jurisdiction. Marshall held, brilliant, brilliant judge, it is emphatically the province 
and duty of the judicial department to say what the law is. Now that sounds like, well, didn't they know that? They didn't know that, okay? The court had to say that. So that, and follow me on this, if two, two laws conflict with each other, the courts must decide on the operation of each. We take that for granted today. So if a law be in opposition to the Constitution, if both the law and the Constitution apply to a particular case, so that the court must either decide that the case conform to the law, disregarding the Constitution, or conform, confirms to the Constitution, and disregarding the law, the court must determine which of these conflicting rules governs the case. Now, that sounds like a lot of gobbledygook. You know, the court, the, the Constitution, the court, but that's the formula, ladies and gentlemen. That's the formula that the Supreme Court determined in 1803 in this case. So Marshall held that it was the province and duty of the Supreme Court to say, to say that the Judiciary Act's grant of a power to issue this writ of mandamus to the Supreme Court was not a valid law. Thus, and this is the big point, in this Marbury case, the court asserted what is today called the power of judicial review to declare the law unconstitutional. This didn't come from a statute. This didn't come from the Constitution. This didn't come from somebody's big speech in, in what was then the Congress. This came from the decision by then Supreme, the then Supreme Court. So this is the beginning of the development of the Supreme Court and its responsibility and its duties. Whoops, sorry. Okay, hit the wrong one. Okay, I want to move now to another Im rather important case in those days, a case called McCulloch versus Maryland. And this involved federal power and the supremacy clause, and it's a case that was decided in 1819. This is the development, this is how the Supreme Court was moving from when it was first created as part of the separation of powers to what it found it could do or could not do. And it was a case, I said, decided in 1819. So, what are the facts? Maryland had placed a prohibitive tax on banknotes of the second bank of the United States located in Maryland. Now, James McCulloch was the branch cashier, didn't like that, so he took that and appealed it to the Supreme Court. And again, John Marshall wrote the decision. And Marshall stated that the Constitution gave Congress the power to make all laws necessary and proper to carry out the specific powers conferred on Congress in Article I, Section 8, incorporating Hamilton's doctrine of broad construction of the Constitution. Now, all this may sound a little bit confusing. It really isn't. This, at this particular point in time, it was necessary for the Supreme Court to determine in what ways these specific powers of government, of the branches of government, could, could they carry them out in accordance with what the Constitution provided. And Marshall wrote, let the end be legitimate. Let it be within the scope of the Constitution and all means which are appropriate, which are not prohibited, prohibited and are constitutional. That's a big deal, big deal him saying that at that time. Since the bank was a lawful instrument of specific federal authority, the law creating the bank was constitutional. That's how the reasoning came about, that since it was a federal bank, the creating of it was constitutional under the circumstances. And Mar Marshall went out to point, point out that Article 6 of the Constitution, which says that the Constitution is the supreme law of the land, 
anything in the laws of any state to the contrary notwithstanding that the power to tax involves the power to destroy, that the states have no power by taxation or otherwise to retard, impede, or control the laws of the federal government, and thus the law imposing a tax on the Bank of the United States was found to be unconstitutional and void in, under these circumstances. So you see, you have that tension going on, tension going on between at that time between the power of the states and what the Supreme Court determines the power of the federal government was. Interesting transitions here. Okay, so let me see here now. I have a, okay. The next case that came, that was, came up of what I think extreme importance at that time was the Dred Scott versus Sanford case. How many of you have heard of the Dred Scott case? Sure, it's way out there, it's way out there. So prior to the Civil War, as you know, people of African American descent, whether free or enslaved, could never be citizens of the United States. Never be citizens. Facts that gave rise to the Dred Scott case are not well understood. After the Constitution's ratification, the slave states and the free states gradually became more bitterly divided. You all remember that from reading your history books and studying history, which led ultimately to the Civil War, obviously. Each side feared that the other side would gain more representation in Congress when new states were admitted to the Union. This fear resulted in something called the Missouri Compromise of 1820, which prohibited slavery in all the new states north of the 36 degree and 30 degree line. Dredd and his wife, Harriet, both slaves, were transported by their owner from Missouri to the free Wisconsin Territory and to the free state of Illinois. And Dred Scott asked the Missouri State Court to declare that his family, his family, was emancipated by virtue of their presence in the free territory. Now Scott at that time won the case because at the time Missouri case law held that a slave was emancipated by virtue of traveling to a free territory or state. A subsequent decision reversed that precedent and ruled against Scott. So Scott took the case then to, these were all state court decisions. Scott then took the case to federal court because he was a citizen of Missouri and his owner, John Sanford, was a citizen of New York. Therefore, you could go to a federal court because of diversity of citizenship. If they were both in the same state, you couldn't. And that's still the case today, by the way. So diversity of citizenship provides for ability to bring a case in federal court. However, however, if Scott was not a citizen, the federal court lacked jurisdiction. That's the clicker. Thus, according to the court, the case should have been dismissed. However, Taney, that was the judge in this case, went even further. He said there was another constitutional question. Was Scott emancipated when his owner brought him north to a federal free territory? Why did Taney want to resolve this issue? Because he, Taney, wanted to provide a definitive resolution to the slavery question. Taney, by the way, himself was pro-slavery. As a result, the second part of the Dred Scott decision now presumed that the court had jurisdiction, which Taney already found that it did not. Interesting. In fact, this court found that the Missouri Compromise wherein Congress designated certain territories as free soil territories was in violation of the Fifth Amendment. 
This amendment prohibits Congress from depriving any person, quote, of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. And what were, what were uh, slaves considered then? Property. Therefore, Taney and the majority reasoned that the Missouri Compromise had the effect of emancipating a slave who is taken into free territory. In effect, the law would deprive the slave owner of his property, the slave, without due process of law. There were two dissents in this case. Probably none of us have ever read these or, you know, had the chance to do it or chose not to. So there was a Justice Curtis who wrote that the Constitution was not made exclusively for the white race. Imagine that back then. When that document was ratified, people of African descent could be citizens in at least five states. And another justice, his name was McLean, wrote, quote, a slave is not mere chattel. He bears the impress of his maker and is amenable to the laws of God and man. As a practical matter, and we all know it from our history books, the Dred Scott decision may well have contributed to the Civil War. Now, I bring up this case to, to give you an idea how the Supreme Court itself was developing. And it wasn't always in the shining light of constitutionality. It, it, it had um, biases, and justices have biases when they come on a court. This is the extreme bias of, of being a, a, a pro-slaver and so forth. And it still exists today, but not to the extent that I'm talking about here. Justices on the Supreme Court who are chosen and, uh, uh, and appointed by the President of the United States and uh, approved by the Senate, they all come with existing biases. That's human nature. And so their decisions to a great extent and their votes on cases, I'm leaving you with this, are their votes on cases very often are influenced by their own biases. Many try to put the biases in the corner of the room where they're talking, but hum human beings do not work that way, as we all know. Ultimately, by the way, Dred Scott, Dred Scott was reversed, not by the Supreme Court, but after the bloody Civil War by the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. Okay, that's what it took. That's what it took. Ironically, Justice Taney, who wrote the decision, somewhat naively believed that he was settling the question of slavery once and for all. Slavery had been a running sore in American politics for many years, largely because it had been fudged or ignored. Unfortunately, Taney, and for the United States as a whole, the Supreme Court's ruling in Dred Scott exacerbated the problem to such an extent that the issue of slavery could only be decided once and for all by armed conflict. And if anybody disagrees with that, and you know, that's what I'm looking for, comments, discussion after Scott was a slave, there was no diversity of citizenship, and therefore no standing to bring the appeal to the Supreme Court. Would one have to accept Taney's reasoning if one assumes for the moment that at the time, a slave was considered property, which would justify Taney's rationale. And, you know, we have to kind of put our, our mind's eye at that particular point in time that many people thought of slaves and African Americans as property, okay? Among constitutional scholars, the Dred Scott case is widely considered the worst decision ever rendered by the Supreme Court. I wonder why. It has been cited in particular as the egregious example in the court's history of wrongly imposing 
a judicial solution on a political problem. And wasn't it that? Wasn't it that? Posing a judicial solution on a po political problem. A later Chief Justice, Charles Evans Hughes, famously characterized the decision as the court's great self-inflicted wound. This was an extreme example where the court, Taney, ignored precedent, distorted history, imposed a rigid rather than a flexible construction on the Constitution, ignored specific grants of power in the Constitution, and tortured meanings out of other more obscure clauses. So let's hope from now to the end of whenever that we have no more judges like Taney, because I think we'll be real trouble. Oh. Hi, my name is Matthew. Kennedy. Okay. I'm a historian, and here are a few things you need to know to sound smart about. Can you hear that? Case. This is the story of a husband and a wife, two enslaved people who both filed for freedom in circuit court in St. Louis, Missouri in 1846 and set off an 11 year odyssey that culminated in 1857 in the most infamous decision of the US Supreme Court. Dred Scott was held as a slave by a family that moved him first to Alabama and then to Missouri. And then he was sold to another man named John Emerson who took him to Wisconsin territory, present day Minnesota, where he was held at Fort Snelling. There he met Harriet Robinson, who was the slave of an Indian agent. They married, they had two daughters, and then John Emerson in owned both of them and their children, took them back to St. Louis. That's when, in 1846, Dred and Harriet Scott filed freedom suits in St. Louis Circuit Court. They knew that there was a doctrine in state courts called once free, always free. If you were an enslaved person held in free territory, like the Wisconsin Territory, then you should be freed even in a slave state like Missouri. That 11-year odyssey took them all the way up to the Supreme Court, the one that ruled against Dred Scott in 1857. The ruling had three main parts. First, it said that blacks did not have rights in federal courts as federal citizens. Second, it said that slave states no longer had to honor the once free, always free doctrine. And third, it said that Congress never should have prohibited slavery in the Wisconsin Territory in the first place, or in any territories. It was a dramatic blow in the sectional crisis. It created a huge firestorm of controversy, and ultimately is one of the leading causes of the coming of the Civil War. Even though the Scots lost their case in court, they actually won their freedom. The children of Scott's original owners, some of them in St. Louis, had become anti-slavery. They had helped fund the Scots' legal case for many years, and now in 1857, they stepped up and bought the family and then freed them. Dred Scott lived another year, but he lived as a free man. His wife and their two daughters lived the rest of their lives as free people. There are still descendants of the Scott family in America today. Despite the tragedy of the case and its infamous nature, there was a human triumph within it. Young people in large numbers came out. Okay, I, I bring this thing up at, at this time uh, simply because uh, it's a portrait of what the Supreme Court was at that time and a portrait of what uh, the justice, the chief justice at the time, Taney, um, uh, the, his background led him to do in, in this particular case. And so what, I guess what I'm saying here and want you to understand that we don't always have heroes on the Supreme Court. We hope to have that justices who are highly educated, who are highly responsive to the issues at hand and will come to uh, certain conclusions that will benefit ultimately the American public. And so this is one of the situations historically where that did not happen, okay? All right, uh, I wanna move on here to something called enumerated powers. <clears throat> and I come to a case which took place during the, the New Deal, actually, of FDR, a case called Schechter Poultry versus the United States. Anybody ever heard of that case? Okay. Uh, FDR's legislative agenda, as many of you may know, pushed the boundaries of how much local conduct Congress could regulate. One of the most significant of these laws was the National Industrial 
Recovery Act, NRA. Under the NRA, <clears throat> private businesses and unions could adopt codes of fair competition that would become legally enforceable once approved by the president. Roosevelt adopted the Live Poultry Co Code, something that's what it was called, Live Poultry Code for New York City. And this code regulated labor conditions at slaughterhouses and specified how chickens could be slaughtered. Schechter Brothers operated a kosher slaughterhouse in Brooklyn. They did not ship their chickens out of state. And the federal government prosecuted them for violating the code. The court unanimously concluded that Congress lacked the power to enact the NRA as a result of this case. Justice Brandeis, a progressive, even agreed that the NRA gave the federal government too much power, too much power to regulate local activities. The court held that neither the slaughtering nor the sales by defendants of chickens were transactions in interstate commerce. The NRA, however, did more than allow the federal government to regulate commerce between one state and another. The law also empowered the executive branch to regulate any transaction in or affecting interstate or foreign commerce. Although the NRA was halted, the court still gave the Roosevelt administration a small victory. The court agreed that Congress can regulate local transactions that merely affect commerce. So they brought it down a step. Rather, the court found that the local sale of chickens did not directly affect interstate commerce. So there's Congress and there's interstate commerce. The effect was only indirect. A little play with words and justices do play with words, as do politicians. Therefore, Congress could not regulate those local transactions because they were too remote from interstate commerce. The court recognized that if Congress could regulate activities that indirectly affected interstate commerce, there would be no limit to the federal power, and for all practical purposes, we should have completely centralized government. Schechter Poultry, which was decided in 1935, was one of the last major defeats FDR suffered at the Supreme Court. Subsequent New Deal le legislation, however, never went as far as the NRA had gone. The Schechter case holding had devastating effects on FDR's New Deal programs in the 1930s. The centerpiece of the New Deal legislation the NIRA was essentially declared unconstitutional. By the late 30s, 1930s, after FDR's court packing attempts failed in Congress, however, the Supreme Court began reading Congress's powers under the Commerce Clause more broadly. By the 60s, 1960s, the court held that congressional statutes outlawing racial segregation <coughs> excuse me, in local businesses were constitutional under the Commerce Clause. So you see how that evolved. By something going back to the New Deal, in the 60s they used these statutes to um, eliminate as much racial segregation in businesses that were possible. Hey guys, welcome to Hip Hughes History. Get nice ready one. for a quick one, baby. We're gonna hit Chester versus United States, 1935. You think Obama has problems? Wait till you find out what FDR had to go through. What a super duper court case to study, guys, if you're doing federalism, the 10th Amendment, um, or you're just doing New Deal stuff. But either way, it's a super duper court case. Um, so FDR comes in in 1933, right? He's got a series of programs called the New Deal, and he's whap, whap, whapping, trying to whap at the Great Depression. So one of these laws is uh, the National Industrial Recovery Act. 
and Code 3 of this huge law passed by Congress gave the executive department, the president, the ability through executive action to enforce codes that were being written by private business groups, trade groups, to promote fair competition. And in this specific case, it's called Chester Poultry uh, Corporation versus the United States, there's a gang of poultry folk. And these poultry folk have written these codes, and some of the codes are like maximum hours you can work and um, some types of safety regulations, um, not selling sick chickens, and basically trying to keep everybody, you know, to have kind of a fair competition kind of thing going. So, what happens? Well, Chester uh, Poultry has done a couple things wrong. They sold a couple sick chickens, and uh, they're also violating the rules that required straight killing. Um, and really quick, it's kind of funny. If you were a customer, according to this code or this rule being enforced by FDR, and you stuck your hand in the chicken coop, you couldn't pick the chicken you wanted to kill. You had to pick the first chicken that touched your hand. And I guess there was laughter in the court when they heard this. But basically, let's get to the decision now. So the question is, um, can Congress, through NERA, give the president the ability to enforce codes and regulations that are being passed by these trade groups? And secondary, does the Interstate Commerce Clause, because that's where the federal government's getting this power, give them the ability to regulate things like uh, uh, the way you kill a chicken or uh, can you sell a chicken to, uh, to a guy with a hat? So let's giddy up and... All right, it's decision time. Now, this is a huge court case, not only because of the decision, but because of the reaction of FDR. So let's get to the decision. It's unanimous. No, void, uh-uh, ain't gonna happen. State power, 10th Amendment, devolution. For the first time, FDR's New Deal programs are getting struck down. And it's definitely kind of a, you know, kind of a line in the sand with the Supreme Court. First, they say, how dare you separation of powers be violated? How can Congress give the president basically the ability to kind of uh, enforce codes that were passed by Congress? This is a violation of separation of powers by Congress giving the president their powers to basically develop um, or to uh, take up legislation. And secondary, and this is the big one, is that they're going to shut them down on Interstate Commerce Clause. The Interstate Commerce Clause, this idea that, look at where Chester get his poultry? Well, he got it from Philadelphia, and he's selling them in Brooklyn. So, therefore, it's under interstate commerce, and look at my hand, and the federal government can regulate it. And what the court says is, no, you've just gone too far. Because what Chester is doing by selling these chickens, he's engaging in intrastate. He's not doing interstate. Interstate can't go from the beginning all the way to the time you pluck the feather out on the butcher table. So basically what they're saying is this is a violation of the 10th Amendment. These types of economic regulations aren't necessarily out-of-the-box cray-cray, but if they're going to be done, they're going to be done by localities and by state, by the people that live there, not by the federal government. It's too much centralized government. So that's basically the decision. It's a shutdown. But what's the reaction? Stay tuned. So I think you get the idea, right? You get the idea that uh, uh, the courts at some point, you know, pull the plug. And um, uh, this was one of the cases actually uh, where that happened. So now um, I want to move on to uh, the right to die. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Uh, presently, eight states and the Washington DC have death with dignity statutes. There may be a couple more, by the way, but at the time um, this material came out, there were only eight. In recent years, in various other states, doctors, terminally ill patients, and death with dignity organizations have challenged the constitutionality of those laws preventing assisted suicide in court. One such challenge was mounted in the mid-90s, 1990s, by Dr. Harold Glucksberg, along with other physicians, patients, and a nonprofit advocacy group. It involved a Washington state statute that makes, quote, promising a suicide a felony. Glucksburg sought the right to honor the wishes of terminally ill patients who asked for his assistance. The case made its way to the Supreme Court in 1997. And Glucksburg, like most litigants who have challenged assisted suicide bans, based his case on the historic 
due process clause, imagine this, the due process clause of the 14th Amendment, which prohibits a state from depriving persons of life, liberty, or property without due process of laws. Now, how would you go about using that clause to uh, uh, permit a right to die, okay? The argument was that the constitutional right of liberty must include the right of a com competent adult to choose, whoops, sorry, go back. <clears throat> um, let's see, uh, get, competent right, this, in this it's, okay, the co argument was that the constitutional right of liberty must include the right of a competent adult to choose to die and to seek assistance in implementing that decision. The Supreme Court in this instance disagreed. The court found that the due process clause does not prevent government from regulating all conceivable liberties, but only certain fundamental liberties rooted in the nation's history and traditions. After reviewing Anglo-American law since the 1400s, the Supreme Court ruled there was no reason to believe that the framers of the Constitution intended to contravene this tradition and establish a right to die. Consequently, it was not unconstitutional, not unconstitutional for a state to criminalize assisted suicide. However, Although the case stands for the proposition that states may lawfully prohibit assisted suicides within their borders, states may conversely allow assisted suicides if they wish. As you are probably aware, anybody here from Oregon? Ah, yes. As you are probably aware, in 1977, Oregon enacted the Death with Dignity Act which permits physicians in well-defined circumstances to provide a lethal dosage of pills to terminally ill patients who seek to end their own sufferings. It is then up to the patient to take the pills or not. And there are several safeguards, by the way, in connection with that statute. The Bush administration challenged the constitutionality of the Death with Dignity Act and in January 2006, the Supreme Court, while not endorsing the law, refused to overturn it. A Gallup poll survey in 2013 found that 70% of Americans were in favor of allowing doctors to hasten a terminally ill patient's death when the matter is described as allowing doctors to, quote, end the patient's life by some painless means. So we've come a long way in that regard. The United States Constitution prevents the government from intruding on many of our intimate decisions. But what about one of the most intimate decisions of all, when and how to die? This is the question the Supreme Court was forced to grapple with in Washington versus Glucksburg. In 1854, Washington State enacted a statute criminalizing assisted suicide, including physician-assisted suicide. Over a century later, Harold Glucksburg, a doctor who practiced medicine in Washington, challenged the modern version of that law. Glucksburg argued that the liberty interest protected by the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment included a fundamental right to assisted suicide. Glucksburg described the liberty interest more broadly as a right to die. The district court agreed with Glucksburg and held the statute unconstitutional. On appeal, the Ninth Circuit affirmed. The United States Supreme Court granted cert. The question was whether the liberty interest protected by the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment included a fundamental right to assisted suicide. Writing for a unanimous court, Chief Justice Rehnquist held that there is no fundamental right to assisted suicide protected by the Due Process Clause. 
the court applied a two-part analysis to determine whether the right to assisted suicide was a fundamental right. First, the court asked whether the right was deeply rooted in the nation's history and traditions. The court observed that Washington State's assisted suicide ban was not unique. In fact, similar laws existed in almost every other state in the country. Further, the tradition of criminalizing or prohibiting assisted suicide originated in the common law, extending as far back as the colonial period. Therefore, the court concluded that the right to assisted suicide wasn't deeply rooted in the nation's history and traditions. Second, the court examined the description of the asserted right to determine if it was sufficiently particular. The court disagreed with Glucksberg's characterization of the right at stake. Glucksberg described the right too broadly as a right to die, which wasn't a sufficiently particular description. Rather, the court viewed the right at stake more narrowly as the right to assisted suicide. On this point, the court clarified the scope of a fundamental right recognized in an earlier case, Cruzan v. Director, Missouri Department of Health. In Cruzan, the court had recognized that a person in a persistent vegetative state has a right to be taken off life support. According to the court, Cruzan was frequently depicted as recognizing a broad right to die. However, the court explained that the fundamental right in Cruzan was the narrower right to refuse life-saving medical treatment, not a general right to die. The court reasoned that forced medical treatment constituted a form of common law battery, and therefore the right to refuse medical treatment, unlike the right to assisted suicide, was deeply rooted in the nation's history and traditions. Because there was no fundamental right at stake, the court applied the rational basis test to the law. This test asks whether the law is rationally related to a legitimate state interest. The court found that Washington had a legitimate interest in preserving life and protecting public trust in the medical profession. Further, these interests were rationally related to the ban. Washington was reasonably concerned that physician-assisted suicide would cause more deaths, erode public trust in the medical community, and create opportunities for coercion, error, and abuse when treating terminally ill patients. Therefore, the court held that Washington's assisted suicide ban didn't violate the Due Process Clause and reversed the Ninth Circuit. Justice Souter concurred in the judgment, elaborating on what he perceived was Washington's strongest interest in preserving human life. He noted that it was legitimate for the legislature to be concerned that physicians might administer life-ending medications out of their own compassion for suffering patients, or because of financial concerns, even if the patient didn't request the procedure. Justice O'Connor wrote a concurring opinion to argue that because there's no constitutional right to suicide, there's no need to consider the narrower question of whether there's a constitutional right to physician-assisted suicide. She also emphasized that the law at issue did permit terminally ill patients to receive pain-relieving medication, even at levels that increased the speed of death. If a law were to prohibit this palliative care, O'Connor suggested that she might reach a different conclusion. In Glucksburg, the court declined to recognize a constitutional right to die. The decision drew a hard line between refusing life-saving treatment, which is constitutionally protected, and accepting life-ending treatment, which is not. A lot of food for thought in that decision. No question about it. And it goes on and it goes on. And uh, it gives you an example also of the Supreme Court taking a set of facts, a case that deals not just with applicable law, but with um, society's concerns with such an important issue as uh, <clears throat> assisted, sui assisted suicide or assisted uh, taking of a life. So I wanted to put that up for you only because it's important for you to understand that the Supreme Court deals very often with these life-changing type of issues, uh, um, both cases that evolve out of statutes that have been enacted in various states around the country and or medical uh, type of uh, uh, issues and so forth. They're not just there to uh, settle disputes uh, dealing with normal everyday activities. These, these, these 
kinds of issues are life and death matters. Okay, so let me see. We have about five minutes. Uh, I'm going to just hit this one here. Maybe we'll go over a little bit. So this is this issue of one nation under God, matters of church and state. Uh, remember, in the Constitution, there is a uh, um, article, and it's also contained in uh, the Bill of Rights, that to preventing the government, whether it be state or federal, particularly from establishing a particular religion. That's the establishment clause. And so <clears throat> there was a case called McCreary County versus the ACLU of Kentucky, 2005 case. And I'll repeat that. The First Amendment states, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. This is known as the establishment clause. Professor <clears throat> Um, Amar, who is a professor at the Yale Law School, contends that the Establishment Clause prohibited Congress from establishing a national church, and I agree. It also prevented Congress from interfering, interfering with those state churches that were already established. Congress can make no law respecting a state establishment of religion. They stay out of it and should stay out of it. Under Amar's view, Professor Amar's view, the Establishment Clause imposes no limitations on states. Rather, the Establishment Clause served as a structural limit on federal power. However, the Supreme Court in recent cases has looked to a much-discussed letter by Thomas Jefferson, which included the now-famous phrase, quote, a wall of separation between church and state. Jefferson states in this letter, I contemplate with sovereign reverence that act of the whole American people which declared that their legislature should make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof thus building a wall of separation between church and state. And we all take this for granted today. I mean, we don't think about this. But consider at the time how uh, uh, the, and occasionally now the Supreme Court does become involved in sort of conflicts between the state and the federal government on this issue, but not much, not much. So there was two cases in 2005 I'm going to just try to get through these, and then we'll, we'll recess here. <clears throat> Mercury County versus ACLU of Kentucky. In this case, officials erected three separate displays of the Ten Commandments, commandments in their courthouses. <clears throat> the ACLU, everybody know who, what the ACLU is? Okay. The ACLU challenged the constitutionality of the first display. The county erected a second display. It surrounded the framed copy of the Ten Commandments with smaller framed copies of patriotic and legal documents that contained religious references. The district, the district court then found that that second display was unconstitutional because it lacked any secular purposes. And the county's object was to instead to advance religion. The phrase secular, as opposed to sectarian, refers to a non-religious purpose. Now a third display, they didn't stop, a third display included an extended text of the Ten Commandments surrounded by equal sized copies of such documents as the Bill of Rights, a picture of Lady Justice, you know, with the fire, holding fire, and the lyrics of the Star Spangled Banner. <laughs> there was also a note explaining that the Ten Commandments influenced the formation of the United States. I'm not sure that's true, but that's what they put there. The lower courts also found the third display unconstitutional. 
So all this was appealed, the judgment was appealed to the Supreme Court, and what do they do with it? The court ruled for the ACLU by a 5-4 vote. The majority, Stevens, Justice Stevens, Justice O'Connor, Justice Ginsburg, she was alive then, and Breyer. The court's majority stated that to determine whether the state has violated the Establishment Clause, it is critical to deter determine what was the government's actual purpose. Justice Souter's opinion focused on the history of the three displays. First display was of the Ten Commandments in isolation, a religious message potentially. The second display only amplified this religious message and left no doubt that the county intended to make a religious statement, a no-no. The third display, which by itself was not problematic, could not be considered in isolation, however. Rather, the court had to consider the two displays that immediately preceded it. You see the analysis that the, the, the Supreme Court goes through on these kinds of cases? I mean, it's, it's, it's mind-boggling in many instances. The court concluded that the county had not shown any secular, secular educational purpose to justify the Ten Commandments display. Quote, the secular purpose required has to be genuine, not a sham, and not merely secondary to a religious objective. As a result, the display violated the Establishment Clause. The county's elaborate arrangement of other documents was merely a pretext, they said, to promote a religious text. Justice Scalia, who was then on the court, dissented. And in his opinion, he denied the court's claim that, quote, the First Amendment mandates a governmental neutrality between religion and non-religion, and that, quote, manifesting a purpose to favor adherence to religion generally is unconstitutional. He objected to that reasoning. <clears throat> okay, now it is now three, a little bit after three, I could go on and on and on, but I promised um, LIR, and I promised uh, this uh, wonderful uh, Rancho Mirage Library that I would stop here and put it open to questions and answers and discussions. So I'm going to do that right now. Thank you very much for your time. Okay. Uh, I don't know, is there anybody here with a mic if anybody's got questions? Okay, I don't know if I can hear you. I will try to, yes. Sorry, yeah, that's what I was, can you hear me? Okay, so the question was um, that in Oregon, um, uh, you know, they have a right uh, uh, to uh, take, you have a right if you are un under certain circumstances to take your own life or have somebody, assisted suicide, I guess it is. 
but before you can just, you don't do this willy-nilly. There are certain statutory requirements. You have to have an, a, uh, an exam and a report by, what, two or three doctors, psychiatrists, whatever the case may be. You have to be terminal, A, and actually have uh, um, 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 reports by, I think it's two physicians, might be more, but there are certain safeguards in Oregon, and so that, that's still in effect, as I understand it. Yeah, yeah. Right, right, because, right, there, there are lots of pot potential issues that can be raised if somebody, you know, is a, 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 a um, recipient in a will or something and is anxious to get, you know, Nelly underground so that he or she can, seriously, I mean, this is, this is a very serious consideration. So that is why in the case of Oregon. Now, I don't know how many other states. There aren't many states like Oregon. I, seven or eight, right, out of 50 states, right. So the, 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 the statement uh, um, was essentially that in many cases, as we all are aware of, uh, a person cannot take that pill physically because maybe they're, you know, uh, uh, physically unable to literally put it down and so forth. So there are other means of uh, doing that, which I think they're not, they're not quite legal yet. Interesting. We've got another question back here. Uh, yeah, okay. Thank we you. got a microphone now. That's good. All right. Yeah. So we have a lot of controversy in this country about the 2020 election. The Supreme Court chose to um, rule down one of the cases, and they didn't even hear about many of the others, that the uh, Donald Trump brought to them. So, in effect, they kind of just said, no, they don't have value. But I'm wondering, in the uh, kind of along the ilk of the Dred Scott, to settle the question once and for all, why doesn't like Biden or somebody take it to the Supreme Court to rule uh, an absolute rule so we could get rid of the controversy, like under defamation or something like that? Well, you have to understand in in any court proceeding, including the Supreme Court. Whoever brings an appeal has to have what they call standing. That, and I'm putting that in quotes, standing, meaning that that person or, you know, a company, if, it, if it's a company, has to have standing with respect to the dispute that's involved. It can't be just, I mean, yes, uh, amicus curiae uh, uh, briefs are filed sometimes, for, you know, by organizations on a particular issue before the Supreme Court, but they're just submitting briefs. They're not the parties of interest. And so it's not necessarily that easy to jump into a case unless you have standing in that case. That's a, a standing, right. That's a question. That, 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 that is a question as to whether or not he himself would have standing. Now, um, if a law, if if a, uh, excuse me, a litigant is bringing an appeal to the Supreme Court based on 
some uh, uh, legitimate complaint that something has been done or not done in violation of the Constitution, yes, then the, I pres you know, the president who is the chief, you know, president in chief of the country may create a, a defense and hire or have his uh, Justice Department get involved in that litigation. But it isn't automatic. It isn't automatic, you see. But it, you know, it may become, it may be. Yeah. I know, you're right, you're right. People get, you know, yes, uh, uh, we get very impatient with the kind of up and down or back and forth. But you know, this, this is the, the, the way the, the rules work at the Supreme Court. You have to have some form of standing, somebody has to have some form of standing to bring an appeal. Yes, up there. Exactly. That's absolutely, that's a very important part of it, sure. And, and, and that you have an interest, you have a specific interest in that particular appeal or in that issue that you want to bring up before the Supreme Court. Uh, on the front here. Thank you. Um, could you explain how Roe versus Wade, a woman's right to choose, could be written uh, at that level, the higher level, so that they could not strike it down as easily as they have? Thank you. Well, the easiest way I can answer that is Roe v. Wade was a, a case, a decision that was in place for 50 years. And I thoroughly agree with you that it, it represented precedent. And keep in mind that word precedent. And along came uh, a new uh, uh, Supreme Court, if you will, you know, uh, uh, ultimately involving six conservatives, right? Six conservatives and three liberals, if you want to divide them divide them up on that basis. And so there was that ability, ability to um, have a case filed which would give an opportunity to the Supreme Court with that majority of conservatives to, to uh, um, over, override the original decision of Roe versus, versus Wade. Now, I'm going to my wife is going to be very mad with me because I always tell this story, okay? Uh, justice Frankfurter, Felix Frankfurter, who was a well-known justice during the, the, the New Deal, okay, made a statement back then in the 30s that the Supreme Court at that time has to be very, very careful about overruling precedent you know what I mean by precedent, where cases have been decided on a certain basis and uh, they've, been, they've held up for years and years and years and years. They can be overruled at certain times if there's a valid reason, legal reason, factual reason to do it. But they have to be very, very careful about overruling precedent. Why? Because sooner or later, there's going to be a majority of conservatives on the, this is what he said, not what I'm saying. There's going to be a majority of, of, of conservatives on the Supreme Court, and they will have the opportunity to do the same thing. And that's exactly what's happened. And that's what happened with Roe versus Wade. You have to have a majority, even if it's a 5-4, as you can see, 20 to 30 percent of the decisions are on a 5-4 basis, nine justices, so, you know, you win by one vote. Did, did Frankfurter actually, was he referring to conservatives I'm versus sorry? liberal? Was Frankfurter actually referring to conservatives versus liberals or just a majority in either direction? Well, Frankfurter was not a conservative, not, not really a conservative, uh, but he was making that statement at the time because don't forget this is during the New Deal when a lot of new legislation was being, or at least attempted to being brought by that administration at the time, depression and so forth. Lots of good questions here. The point is, if the Supreme Court wants the 
find make a finding they will f make they will find a way and they will bend whatever rules they want to bend um, you know um, the fact is yes I, I can say yes and no to that and the no is if the decision is so warped and against what Congress feels the public does not want, it's not an easy thing, if a particular majority in Congress has the power to do so, they will enact legislation, not always, but in certain instances to literally overrule the decision made by the Supreme Court. It has happened and will happen. It will happen, right? It will happen. Good questions. With the Supreme Court being the ultimate rule of the land, how is it that they do not have to adhere to any ethical standards? I, could, I couldn't get all your question. With the Supreme Court being the supreme law of the land, yes. How is it that they're one of the few branches of government that have no ethical standards to which they need to adhere? Good question. And I think, I think there is, um, it's just that at the time, um, the court, you know, at the time the Supreme Court uh, was evolving, if you will, um, there was never a, th a thought in any Congress, Republican, Democrat, whatever, of having to do that. And, but, but now there's a lot of noise being made about maybe there should be some ethical guidelines for the justices on the Supreme Court. And I think, I think there's, a, there's a movement afoot in Congress, don't know whether it's Democrat or Republican or maybe both, but there is a movement to create some sort of ethical guidelines. It was always thought that the, the, the justices people who were appointed to the Supreme Court would, on their own, be able to um, uh, guide themselves when it came to proper ethics on the court as to what they did that they wouldn't uh, get involved in any co conflicts. In other words, most of the time, any judge, whether it's on the Supreme Court or a court here in California or in Connecticut where I come from, if they have a basis for any kind of conflict in deciding a case, they should um, recuse themselves from that decision. I mean, that's, you know, that's, that's not, nothing for me. That, that's, that's a given, that's a given. Now, in, in this, in the case of the Supreme Court, one would think, one would think, and I'm not, I'm not identifying any individuals, but one would, one would think that at this stage of the game, if it's so obvious that uh, that justice um, has a reason to believe that he would create, he or she would create the appearance of impropriety in sitting on that case and perhaps even writing a concurring opinion or whatever the case may be, that is, is cause for criticism in my mind. Okay, I mean, I, I don't care whether you're Republican, Democrat, conservative, liberal, that is, a, that, is a, that is a basis for criticism because a judge is supposed to um, uh, give all appearances of being neutral until he or she hears the arguments and the briefing and reads the briefing and, and votes on it. It's as simple as that, or maybe not so simple, I don't know. We've yes, got one all the way in the back here. I'm sorry? Yeah, it's based on the right of privacy, and there's no there's no uh, word such word in the Constitution called privacy. However, an ar their argument, you know, somebody made was that it's inherent in the Constitution. You know, all rights and privileges and so forth. Don't use the word privacy, 
but one could argue that. And that's what was argued, that there was a right of privacy going back 50 years. They didn't agree, they didn't agree with it or they used that as a basis to overturn it. That's. <laughs> Um, At a particular time. Yes, sir. Hold on. Excellent lecture. But I just want to say the Dred Scott case isn't just a huge part of constitutional history or Supreme Court history. It's a huge part of American history. Yes. But I guarantee you, I guarantee you in 10 years' time, Dred Scott won't even be mentioned in history books in probably at least 25 states because many boards of education see it as black history. And what they're trying to do is remove all of African American history from history books. Dred Scott is the perfect case for an AP African American history course. But you know, Florida and other states are getting rid of African American history. So. Well, it's wrong to do that. It's wrong, to, you're absolutely right. It's wrong to do that because um, you know, uh, American history, I, I don't know whether I should say that, ha has a lot of good involved in it, but it also has a lot of bad involved in it. And we should, all Americans should be aware of it from, you know, so things like, things like that, even remotely like that, don't continue to happen. And yes, very good point, very good point. I think we got maybe time for two more questions. Sir. Okay, this very simple question. All right. In the Taney decision, uh, in the Dred Scott case, how many other justices uh, agreed with Taney's decision versus uh, opposed the decision? What was the split? What was, what was the split? Okay. Uh, well, it had, to be, it had to be a majority, and as I understand it, uh, there were only two justices who wrote dissenting opinions. So I would have to believe that it was probably, what, seven to two. That, that's my understanding, but I, you know, I stand to correct it. So there were at least two, dis nobody else wrote a dissent dissenting opinion, and nobody else wrote a concurring opinion. So the other justices went along with, um, t with Taney and Dred Scott. Any At final? Oh, go ahead. Okay. One more question, maybe. Anyone else that hasn't asked one yet? Just, okay, she's had her hand up here for a while. Let's finish it with you. question with regard to overturning overturning Roe v. Wade and it, it it seems I'm surprised it hasn't come up yet uh, sending using the US mail to take mephipristone across state lines I could see that that could really get hairy but nothing has, seems to have happened yet uh, I, I'm, I'm not I, did, I lost a little bit of that uh, I don't <laughs> The question was about um, shipping uh, abortion medication across state lines and if that is going to make it to the Supreme Court in a different way. Well, I, I, I think, you know, um, it's happening. Let's put it that way. It's happening. And I would anticipate that sooner or later there's going to be some attempt on the part of states which um, do not uh, allow abortion within you know certain time periods and they're going to bring some sort of legal action and that's going to end up in the courts i personally believe that all right if everybody could please help me thank today's speaker jerry swirsky thank you so much Jerry. thank you